You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine strange claims about alternative history and ancient alien in popular media. Do their claims hold water to an archaeologist? Are there better explanations out there? We are now on episode 62 and I am Frederick, your guide into the world of pseudo-archaeology. In this episode, I will examine different Maya conspiracies found within the ancient alien mythology. And I have the help from Dimitris and Marie, and these are the brains behind the Instagram account of ancient Maya history. Now, is there any truth to the claim that the Maya ruler Pakal was uh, depicted flying a spaceship? Are blood rituals a misunderstanding of how the aliens communicated with humans? Is the Olmec evidence of alien travelers in Mesoamerica? As you might suspect, the answer to these questions are no. But <laughs> tune in to hear the real history behind these claims. The conspiracies are all taken from the Ancient Alien episode 1 from season 4. As usual, reading suggestions can be found on my website, diggingupancientaliens.com. I also want to thank those who support the show with financial means. This really helps with upkeep and I'm extremely, extremely grateful for your contributions. And if you want to help out, I will tell you where to go later in the episode. Now that we have finished with our preparations, let's dig into the episode. So I want to welcome for the first time on Digging Up Ancient Aliens and the Archaeological Podcast Network, Marie and Dimitris, who is hosting the Instagram account Ancient Maya History. History. Welcome, Marie. Welcome, Dimitris. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you? Doing all right. I'm <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, would you mind maybe introduce yourself to the audience? Marie, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Marie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bonn in Germany, and I'm currently writing my um, thesis, or I just started writing my thesis about the hieroglyphic inscriptions of the Hishwitz Kingdom in uh, Peteng, Guatemala. Uh, as for me, my name is Dimitri. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at the University of Bonn, um, and uh, I'm also, I mean, I started my PhD a few months ago. It's on the early hieroglyphic histories of the classic Maya and how they um, uh, chose to record their own historiographical knowledge. That's really interesting. I think you really liked how they presented the decoding of the Mayan hieroglyphs, but that's a little bit for later. Have you encountered these ancient alien alternative history claims previously? Well, um, I actually used to be on that camp, so to say. That's kind of how I got into archaeology. And uh, really? when I was, uh, yeah, yeah, as a young teenager, in my when I was like eleven or twelve, I was really big on Eric von Däniken's books. I was reading uh, Childress. Uh, Moved on to Edgar Casey, Graham Hancock had the uh, Atlantis Lemuria phase, yeah. And and uh, after some years, I just realized it's all <laughs> rubbish, and uh, that left me with um, Virgin and uh, Mesoamerica was the region that interested me the most. Uh, so it was kind of surreal watching this episode because I know this episode. Uh, there was a time when I watched it around 12, 13 years ago, and I found it very compelling. So coming back to it now. Yeah, I can imagine. It's uh, quite interesting. What I'm sorry to get into that, but uh, we never actually had one who had a pause in this uh, here. But what really got you out of this kind of belief in the ancient alien sphere? And um, 
so it was it was a few a few small things here and there. um sorry it was a, a few things small things here and there uh, it was like small things in books where I thought hey this doesn't really line up with what I've been taught by Fondanik and whatever but the big breaking point was uh, a debunking documentary on YouTube actually it's still on YouTube called Ancient Aliens Debunked it came out in September of 2012 and that started my journey into losing confidence in uh, pseudo archaeology at first it was denial but then i thought in good conscience i couldn't ignore evidence that was there and in my mind at the time i just wanted to learn the truth really mm. and even if i didn't like where the evidence was taking me i thought it's only fair to follow through and that's when i understood the difference between archaeology and pseudo archaeology and i thought hey archaeology sounds a lot more cooler so i that's kind of what i want to do for the rest of my life so i just it put me on a path yeah it's quite an inspirational journey going from ancient alien believer to an archaeologist but i guess as you say there's the hardest part is to get out of that thinking because if i understand it right it it is a little bit more as a belief religion kind of way when you get into it or how would you yeah, describe it, it? Yeah. yeah 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 i mean at the time i was i just found it really interesting i wasn't 100 percent believer on everything but i thought they were doing um they were writing some interesting books and i thought hey this is uh i like i love the mystery the whole hmm. allure of it all and uh yeah it's only later when i realized okay real <laughs> archaeology is actually so when we talk about real archaeology, should we maybe poke on your old wounds then <laughs> and uh, start the whole endeavor? So they choose to start in Palenque. Why would they start there as Mayanologists that you are? Well, I guess they chose it because it's um, one of the most popular Maya sites. I mean, I guess it's one of the most famous. Many people know about Palenque. It has beautiful architecture and uh, monumental styles. It's, I would say, one of the most beautiful styles of um, Maya carvings, Maya uh, art, basically. And I guess in their case, they specifically chose it also because of the um, Palenque sarcophagus astronaut in his spaceship bullshit i'm sorry uh, i guess we're going to talk more about that later as well but i assume it's more because they wanted to choose something that most people would probably have heard of already and because it's just one of the most well-known and um most well-known sites in the Maya area, and it has also been studied extensively by uh, archaeologists, epigraphers, um, in terms of the iconography and so on. Did they say anything that struck you as weird if you look over the Pakal's uh, tomb lid and space rocket? Well, everything basically <laughs> is just rock. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the thing is that we... Even though we might not perfectly understand it, I mean, we, we understand it very well by now, especially because we also can read the hieroglyphic inscriptions on the um, sarcophagus itself. It is very clear that it was a sarcophagus. They found the, uh, the corpse of Kinichana Pakal, um, one of the most famous and most influential um, rulers of the classic Maya world, and of Palenque especially, in the tomb. And the, all of the inscriptions on the sarcophagus itself, the, the iconography in the tomb, point to it being a mortuary monument this is not debatable at all like it's obvious that the whole iconography and everything in the temple points to this being the final resting place of Kinichana Takal and also the extensive tablets that were found in the sanctuary of the of the temple of the inscriptions this um, temple that the tomb was found in basically are also a narrative of um the history of Palenque, Kinishrana Pakal's achievements, and lastly, him being interred uh, in the tomb, and then the building program being finalized by his son, basically. So there's actually no question about that. But of course, we can in detail analyze the iconography of the sarcophagus lid as well, if, if you want, because they specul speculate a lot about that. Yeah, let's. we can move to the Pakal, because he i think he's the main reason why they are there real and pakal's lead we in the episode they even spend quite some time with um, i think it's some sort of 
3D model maker, manufacturer. <laughs> it's a guy at least <laughs> claiming that he has made a very realistic version of Pakal's tomb and showing how he would have operated this spaceship, they claim, is uh, depicted mm. on uh, the sarcophagus lid. And if you go to the episode page, I will probably have been able to put in a photo of this amazing 3D model. But um, what are we looking at when we're looking at this um, Pakal's lid? Because it is one of the most famous ancient alien claims that he sits in his rocket. He has his wrist on his uh, uh, gear that he drives the spaceship with. He has a breathing apparatus and he has uh, pedals for his feet. I mean, it's quite a compelling case. Of course, this is a spaceship, right? I mean, this has uh, become like iconic in the ancient astronaut world and Ever since the beginning, when Von Däniken wrote Chariots of the Gods, one of his most popular books back in the 60s, that was one of his best examples, according to him. And mm. I think until today, this, this is one of the best pieces of evidence <laughs> he has, which is quite unfortunate because it's a terrible example. <laughs> um, what, watching the episode, we thought the, the model that they made, it was kind of pointless, really, because it's, it do- doesn't really prove anything. Um, it mostly represents what they wish was true, because I, I can't imagine as an archaeologist. They also don't compare it to any other Maya monuments. And I mean, yeah. we know basically all of the elements that they misinterpret from other monuments where they are named. Some of them, like the, for example, the um, controls that he's supposedly manipulating is... Uh, the head variant of a specific glyph that we know, the lem, the the shiner glyph, because the um, what they say is like the central axis of the spaceship is actually a shiny jewel tree, and we have this spelled out in the accompanying tablets in the sanctuary of the of the temple of the inscriptions of the same temple. So there's actually no question as to what this is. Yeah, and the the whole argument just hinges on the idea that the Maya stopped representing their their normal, their standard imagery. And for some mm. reason, in this case, they try to represent something completely different. And if we take into account the context in, in which the sarcophagus lid is in, as Marie said already, the inscriptions... The- yeah, I think it might be interesting to hear a little bit on a few of them, at least, the most classical ones, the flames coming out at the bottom, the breathing apparatus, and, Mm. of course, the foot pedals. How would you explain the foot pedals? (laughs) Well, I can preface this by saying that we, this is like a small self-promotion, it's all right, we we made a 10-part series debunking this absolute bullshit. I'm sorry, I hope I can swear lightly on this episode. So we made a 10-part series debunking... um, all of these elements that ancient aliens misinterpreted and um, all of the so the the angle that they say is the the guy in the spaceship for example is a well-known baby pose in Maya art this also fits um, the baby kawil like a baby version of a common deity in Maya art that's very common in the um, cross group uh, temples and in general in um, in this area of uh, in Palenque and um, Sorry, now I forgot what I wanted to say. The foot pedal. Yeah, do you want to talk about the foot pedal? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the the foot. I mean, the if we think about it logically, this is a, one of the worst spots to put a foot pedal. So, <laughs> I don't quite see how that strengthens their idea. But uh, what Pakal's foot is touching is actually part of a much larger um, collection of signs which we understand as it's, it's been referred to as a sacrificial vase, which is like a vase or a vessel that contains a bunch of, a bunch of things. And um, some of it, sometimes we see a uh, stingray spine in there, elements that we can't, can't quite identify just yet, and uh, spondylus shells. And the spondylus shell is what is touching uh, Pakal's foot, actually, or vice versa, I would say. And so we have Paul Francis, who is quite frequent in these um, areas, and he claiming this is a breathing apparatus that's even called the giver of life. 
the souls transfer through this and a giver of life to me would mean air. I mean, we breathe air. So this would mean that this guy needs this mask to survive. But you're saying this is not called the giver of life. Uh, honestly, we don't know where he got that from. It appears he just made that up. <laughs> it's not called the giver of life. It's, it's not even referred to at all. And compared to the hundreds of examples of nose piercings that we have throughout Maya art, it's mm. a pretty standard way of representing a nose piercing. In fact, yeah. I'm sorry. Don't also ahead, the, the supposed breathing apparatus or the nose piercing is not attached to anything, which you can see in the original photos of the original sarcophagus yeah. lid. So I'm wondering how this would have worked. Uh, same <laughs> with the telescope. I have no idea where they see this freaking telescope. There is no telescope. <laughs> the 3D model creator did attach it to some tube going behind a call. You just need to yeah. imagine it to be there. <laughs> yeah, the model is very accurate, of course. It uh, accurately <laughs> wraps it. <laughs> but you're claiming that the exhaust port of the spaceship isn't the exhaust port, but pre-trunk with a nose piercing? It's uh, the where the exhaust would be is where we would expect the roots of the tree. Mm. And we know it's a tree because the Maya themselves refer to it as a tree. In the hieroglyphic inscriptions, at the Temple of the Inscriptions especially, where we find the sarcophagus lid, they refer to the tree depicted. And we have several examples of the same hieroglyphic spelling of this name. And the exhaust that you are referring to is, I mean, what they are referring to as the exhaust or the, um, like the body of the spaceship with the exhaust underneath is actually an open uh, centipede maw. This is also a very common element in classic Maya art. And um, centipede maws um, were basically um, entrances to the underworld. Uh, this, the glyph that is used for the, the centipede maw also exists as a glyph why um, that's mm. basically it's based on the appearance of the centipede mod is also very clear and it can have different meanings among others also hole or entrance so it's very likely that pakal uh, after his death is basically rising again being reborn from the underworld that's also why he is in a baby pose in this baby pose that i but um pakal How um, would you describe his role for Palenque? As far as I understand it, he de didn't originate in Palenque, he came elsewhere? Well, as, as far as we know, he, um, he was a pivotal ruler at Palenque, and he came around a very tumultuous time when Palenque had been attacked by several of its enemies. And we know this because they recorded these events in their uh, hieroglyphic texts. Akal was <clears throat> a ruler who took the throne from a very young age. As far as we know, his mother, she was from Palenque, uh, and uh, his father is less clear, um, but we can talk about it. Uh, we also can see in the temple of the inscriptions in the, in the three tablets or panels that um, they also describe how Pakal basically brought Palenque back, or like kind of elevated the status of Palenque. And they also explain how he fulfilled his religious duties, we might call them, that he celebrated, celebrated important period endings. So it's also possible that they kind of also put a religious significance to this, or that they narrate this story in the temple of the inscription, in his temple of the temple of the inscription. Things were starting to look up again as Pakal. Mm. So he brought them back to the good old days. <laughs> the original Trump. Uh, no, maybe not. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I'm not a Mayanologist. I'm quite open with that. I've read and listened to what uh, bit of stuff. But we do see quite a lot of um, people who actually have real credentials throughout the episode. Edwin Barnhart, for example, and mm -hmm. uh, Mark Van Stone. Is that names that you're familiar with? Yes. Absolutely. They're well-respected scholars in the fields. Gerardo Aldana, he's also another one. 
uh, you know, Calvin, uh, I forget. There's a lot, quite a few people who are in there. Marie, do you remember anyone else? Uh, not right now, no. But yeah, they are there for um, providing some basic facts about the site, about yeah, I'm quite what? certain. I actually had to go in because I was not familiar with uh, Mark Van Stone. And since he had written about the uh, 2012 apocalypse, mm-hmm. for some time I actually started to suspect that he was one of the ancient uh, alienists because he was so poorly edited. Oh. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> until I actually looked him up. Oh, no. <laughs> well, He's um, very good. He's also a very good illustrator. And he actually did, he uh, um, partly wrote and illustrated one of the bogeific studies Ooh. in hieroglyphic studies. How about we move on? How familiar are you two with the uh, astronomy of ancient Maya? Well, we, we have read about it and it's uh, a point, it's actually one of the oldest, I think, parts of uh, Maya studies because it was also kind of decoded around the same time as the calendar was. That is before mm. the writing system was dis- fully deciphered. And uh, in this episode, we, <laughs> well, essentially, we, th- there were some claims made, but at the same time, there were vague questions that don't really lead anywhere. So we notice, for example, that they talk about procession that the Maya uh, calculates procession with incredible accuracy. Hmm. Uh, now, that seems to be a misrepresentation of a study of Maya astronomy that was done uh, by a well-respected Mayanist. And um, as far as we can tell, we don't know if the Maya calculated procession. Um, there are some excerpts in Maya texts that record large or very long periods of time. And these could very roughly line up with um, 26,000 years. Actually, it's around 30,000 years. And um, that has been taken. Yeah, I think their main idea is that um, first, a classical claim that, as you mentioned, that the Mayans were, had a very advanced astronomical knowledge compared to other civilizations. I think they mentioned Egyptians and Sumerians because you can just compare those two. But <laughs> they also make claims like how could this civilization be able to make this astronomical prediction if they haven't watched the stars for thousands of years? Because mm-hmm. that's how astronomy works for some reason. Uh, I mean, it's not that our astronomer sits and look at uh, thousands of years of uh, data to be able to predict astronomical features. Yeah, they usually want to make a connection to uh, space because aliens are from space and they're hinting mm-hmm. at they got this knowledge from the space aliens. Well, to be honest, I think it's kind of racist. I know that some ancient aliens people are always saying, no, it's not racist because we also say that these people were influenced by aliens. But uh, we've we've talked, Dimitris and I talked about this today already, that we, I mean, if you listen to the episode and how they talk about the ancient Maya and how they continuously say stuff like, how could the Maya have been so advanced? Where did they advance intelligence come from? They could mm. have never uh, been able to come up with this on their own, which is just pathetic, to be honest. Like, they, the ancient Greeks also know about these things. Would they say that the ancient Greeks wouldn't have been able to come up with this on their own. They weren't intelligent enough. They had mm. to have had, had help from aliens. No, they would probably not, or most of them would probably not say that. And I think that we underestimate the dedication of mine astronomers to observing the skies for probably yeah, hundreds of years. And they took detailed notes of that. We know that from the codices. Of course, um, unfortunately, we don't uh, have a lot of codices left. Um, but we basically know that they determined patterns um, in the movement of the celestial objects and they in, in integrated them into their uh, calendrical system, or at least they kind of correlated them in ways. 
And mm. um, I think to say that they were able, like they say in the episode, they were able to predict um, the position of Venus for the next 10,000 years accurately to a couple of hours, just, I, I don't know how. To be honest, I don't know where they get that from. I, I think it was very precise, but I think they're trying to accept Yeah, and that's a little bit, as you mentioned, ancient aliens to get, get back. I mean, there's a racist element in how they describe different civilization. So in the previous episode, I covered, for example, the Torin Shroud. And it really differs in how they talk about European artifacts or culture or for example the golden hats out of germany for that uh, matter too they don't use the epithets as primitive and those things when they talk about european things and um, as for the astronomical as you say you don't need a lot of advanced materials really to observe how the bodies move uh, on the sky and also noting it down and i don't really think that they are that precise as you harking at but um i mean ancient aliens have a bad habit of making things up just willy-nilly uh, to be honest it's a very polite way to put it but yes um, they do that <laughs> and this is sort of <clears throat> this is sort of a running theme throughout the episodes not just regarding astronomy in a sense, a lot of the things they say and how they phrase things feeds into the way indigenous civilizations and cultures are perceived in the United States or in the rest mm. of the Western world. Whereas what we would call something like double standards, where civilizations in the Middle East or in Europe could uh, achieve things on their own, whereas this gets called into question where we're talking about indigenous knowledge and how that was achieved. But not just that, also practices such as human sacrifice, which um, the hmm. world we... Hmm. I want to return to the blood sacrifice uh, in a moment. But uh, when we're on the topic of racist, uh, they of course bring up the Almec, even though it's not really uh, Mayan. It's, the, as I understand it, the culture before Mayan, who of course might have influenced quite a bit my later Mayan civilizations. Uh, please correct me if I'm misunderstanding there, but they bring up my favorite racist theory in Ancient Aliens in this episode. The black people in uh, Mesoamerica. So they're claiming that the Olmec heads, and they even show a little statue that the, I'm not sure really where it originates, and you have Giorgio Succalus, the guy with the famous haircut, uh, sits and claiming that this man depicts an uh, African wearing a spacesuit. I don't understand the logic, to be honest. They're like the Olmec heads. They look out of place. They don't look like the people, uh, like we imagine the people to look like in the Isthmus region of Mexico, when this is exactly what the people in this region nowadays look like. But I also don't understand, like they say, they they look out of place. They don't look like the people from there. They look African, but they're also aliens in a way. Like, I don't, it's, are these ancient african aliens or what is the logic yeah that would screw up a lot of their narratives if the aliens were black and uh, i think they just picked them up and dropped them off i don't know uh, but it reminds me of uh, have you read um, Catherine mclean's uh, book the all mc football player it's a um, old sci-fi novel about an american football player who uh, gets trapped in some time loop and travels back to Olmec time and influence on how they view, uh, you know, with the headgear and everything. But she, oh, wow. she's not part of the ancient alien crowd. She wrote it as far as I understand it, a, you know, fantasy novel, you know, oh, wouldn't it be fun if, you know, American football player went back in time to Olmec and became king kind of narrative. <laughs> Actually, that that is, that is somehow kind of fitting, to be honest, because uh, one of the um, most popular theories among academic circles, at least, regarding the Olmec heads, is that the helmets that they wear may have been used 
for the Mesoamerican ballgame. And for mm. people who are listening and might not know, in Mesoamerica, there was this, um, I mean, today we call it the ball game. We don't really know what they called it back then. But it was this game that they would play with a ball that you would um, hit with your hips or your elbows or your shoulders, depending on the rules and the region. And we have thousands of ball courts all throughout Mesoamerica, not just in the Maya area, uh, also in central Mexico, for example. And going a step further, um, in the last few years, we've been, I mean, not us, but colleagues of ours that are working on this, that are represented on the helmets. Names. Hmm. Of- oh. So she was 100% right. <laughs> the ball game is a very interesting topic that unfortunately don't spend that much time on, but, but it was really an important part of Mayan and Aztec culture. Do we know if the Olmec really had the ball? Do we have Olmec ball courts or it's uncertain? I think we do. Marie, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think there I'm are. Not completely, I'm not completely sure, but I think they've also found balls, but I'm, I cannot tell you exactly. I've had a total brain freeze right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hmm. But uh, several oh, countries. That sounds really cool. would be interesting to see. We have to look that up one of these you days. Can... Yeah, it would be fun to share with everyone. Uh, as you say, it might not be accurate, but I think it would give an idea on how it could be. <laughs> uh, I mean, as far as I understand it, it seems as there was a gambling addiction and things like that going back to the ball games uh, back then in ancient Maya times too. So. <laughs> Uh, seems to be part of the human experience. But now when we have discussed the uh, Almec, I think even Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer, had some ideas about the Almecs being Scandinavian. Not sure how he got to that point, but a uh, completely different issue. Heyerdahl is a bit problematic when you look back at him. But um, let's move on to maybe your neck of the woods. Um, we have a quote in the episode. For centuries, the glyphs found throughout Mesoamerica were undecipherable. Then, in 1880, German librarian and anthropologist Ernst Förstemann cracked the code. As far as I get the episode, they seem to hint that he broke the code. But as I understand it, Linda Shealy was part of that conference who actually broke the code on uh, the Mayan hieroglyphs. How do these two people, um, where do they fit in history and what did they really discover? Dimitri, do you want to, oh, I can start. So Ernst Försterman <laughs> didn't actually decipher the hieroglyphic system in its entirety. He, as far as I know, deciphered um, and analyzed calendrics mainly. Um, but the decipherment or probably what we can, we would rather be able to call it decipherment, only came later, um, mainly spearheaded by uh, Yuri Knorosov, uh, when he determined, finally determined that the Maya hieroglyphic system was logosyllabic, which was, uh, of course, needed, we needed to understand that in order to uh, be able to advance in decipherment. Um, yeah. Because yeah, it was, before... it was a long, it was a long process. Um, because until Knorosov's time, there were people that had tried to make a case for for phoneticism in Maya writing, and that led to several unsuccessful attempts, and sort of did a lot of damage to this idea. And especially um, Eric Thompson, one of the most influential Mayanists of all time, he played a big role in uh, steering this debate. He was not a big fan of the Maya writing being phonetic, and he exercised a lot of influence over that. But eventually, Knorosov, as Marie said, Knorosov's uh, methods of decipherment showed that it was it was actually phonetic. And in the early 50s and 60s, it uh, took some time to take off. But in the US, people started paying more attention to Knorosov. And I would say around the 80s is when a big uh, decipherment boom started happening where more syllables were being deciphered and that was and that just grew exponentially from there what linda Sheely did that was back in i think the 70s the first mesa redonda the palenque round table 
Hmm. This was uh, one of the most influential events in my epigraphy because uh, Linda, uh, building on um, the work done by Tatiana Proskoryakov and other researchers, uh, proved that the inscriptions of Palenque were recording actual history and uh, um, more long term. So I'd say by the, na- the 1990s, decipherment had, uh, was in full swing. And um, since then, it's the remainder of signs that um, have, yet to been, have yet to be deciphered. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last uh, sentence there, I think. The last se- uh, sentence. Around like six. So what is uh, the main challenge with the remaining 40% of the glyphs? I think the problem is mainly that for many of the remaining glyphs, we don't have um, what's called either substitutions um, or phonetic complements, how we call them. So um, it, so we don't have sufficient evidence or sufficient hints at the, um, the sounds of the words, basically. So usually when we want to decipher a glyph in my hieroglyphic writing, we either look at uh, substitutions. So um, when different glyphs are used to um, spell the same thing, basically, and we can determine that um, semantically, for example, or with, for example, if we have the birth date of a ruler and we don't know a specific part of it, his name, for example, Kinichana Pakal, um, then, but we have, I don't know, a lot of versions of spellings of his name. And uh, because the Maya loved to write things in different ways to be as aesthetic um, as possible, we often have different spellings that then give us hints to undeciphered components of other spellings, for example. But for the remaining glyphs that we haven't deciphered yet, we don't have a lot of hints at their readings. That's mainly the problem because we don't have Either we haven't found the mon- monuments that basically give us these hints, or because they are so standardized, or the, the ancient Maya thought they were so obvious, basically, that they don't give us phonetic compliments to, to basically tell us um, this is what we mean. But did, uh, It's a work in progress. Yeah. yeah. Did the Mayans have a set, uh, set of rules for their writings, or was it quite freely in how you could express yourself? Um, you mean in terms of spelling or in, in the structure of the text? Both structure and spelling. So s- spelling conventions are quite... I mean, of, of course, there were spelling conventions. There are tendencies that we can observe as we study the text. Uh, but the Maya system was also very fluid and very playful. And it really gives uh, creative room for the scribe, the artist to express himself and or herself and write things in different ways. So you can write uh, your name, for example, in 10 different ways and still have more var- variants. It's actually a very um, playful system, a very creative system. Now, in terms of the structure of the text, that here's where it gets a bit more rigid. Uh, monumental texts, at least, they follow a certain pattern. So we start with the dates, we start with um, uh, short uh, phrases and sentences that describe historical events in a very official manner. Now, this has to do with the medium as well, because on ceramic texts or in the codices, we see different genres. On ceramics, for example, we see different figures being represented. Hmm. But back then, there must be different genres of expressing themselves. So how was the codices, uh, what were they made of? How did the typical codices look like? Well, they were basically folded books containing of um, being made of bark paper that they wrote on. And they were basically folded like a, oh, I don't know how to say that in English. Like an accordion. Like an accordion, yes. <laughs> it's the harmonica in German, yeah, like an accordion. And uh, yeah, that's what... Interesting. And how would the literacy rate have been in the Maya society? Was it only a few in the uppermost top that could read, or would this have been, or would other people been able to read it? 
We don't know, basically. I think that it's unlikely that the literacy rates would have been very high. First of all, because my hieroglyphic writing is very difficult to learn. I, of course, it's easier for Maya people. Also, nowadays, it's easier for for Maya people to learn it because they have the cultural background um, for it. They have the often have the linguistic background, so it would have probably been easier. But still, the aesthetic variation and the style of the glyphs, I think, would have made it very difficult for commoners to read. And also, the the existence of pseudo glyphs, for example, on many vases, shows us that glyphs definitely had a kind of prestige. But not everyone was able to read and write. Um, and in other times, for example, we have examples of writing where it's likely that someone would have kind of drafted it and someone would have copied the text. And there would have been different kinds of, um, let's say, specialties also in, in producing monuments, in producing codices and ceramic texts. Um, and sometimes it's evident that apparently the, the person who copied the text, who made the final product, also sometimes didn't really understand what they're writing because sometimes we have errors, for example, that uh, stem from copying, for example. Interesting. Can we see some sort of dialect between the different uh, Maya city-states? For example, in Sweden, if we look at the earliest uh, writing on the rune stones, we can actually see different dialects because they wrote as they spoke. So you get them um, you can get a glimpse on how the different uh, regions talk that way. Do you see a similar uh, thing in the Maya literature, or they were more standardized in that sense? Uh, yes and no. So the language of the hieroglyphic inscriptions is broadly known as classic Maya. And this language was, was fairly conservative because we see it written continuously for centuries. And it's seems to remain, it seems to be fairly conservative. Maybe spelling conventions and tendencies seem to change uh, toward the terminal classics, that's around 800, 900 uh, CE. But we do see in some cases uh, that some sites may uh, mm -hmm. tend to use certain terms a lot more, or in some cases the, we might see uh, indications of local dialectal features. Because keep in mind, classic Mayan was not the native language of everyone in the Maya area. And today, there are about 30 Maya languages that are spoken. Mm. And back then, the number would have been uh, around the same or significantly larger, we're not sure. But uh, even in ancient times, there were different Maya languages, not dialects, there will be languages that were spoken throughout the Maya world. And those who could read or write, the elite Latin became mm. text in Yucatec Maya. And uh, interestingly, nowadays, some of our friends from um, Guatemala are basically revitalizing the hieroglyphic script and using it for their art, for example, or also sometimes to um, spell specific things, for example, the names of the uh, linguistic communities in Guatemala. And because, for example, one of our friends does it in Kachikel, it's a Highland Maya language, and mm. they have specific sounds that did, just did not exist in classic Mayan, um, because it's from, it's from the same language family, but it's from a completely different branch of the language family, for example. And for example, they have the R, R sound, in Kachikel, um, which didn't exist in classic Mayan, or also other sounds, for example, the k, uh, the, the q, glottalized q that didn't exist in classic Mayan. Mm. So they have to either invent new signs to represent these sounds, and usually they follow the invention invention of new signs principles of uh, classic Maya. Uh, so they choose um, signs also with cultural significance, for example. And um, then they basically try to adapt the old system to their uh, contemporary lingu lingu linguistic situation and make it usable again by modifying old signs or by inventing new ones. So the Maya glyphs is making a bit of revival, at least in Guatemala. That's nice to hear. Do you think that can be useful for future decoding of the Maya ancient Maya script, or you don't think it will affect um, the outcome, maybe more interest 
could come from it? I definitely think that the more Maya people who are also getting into the field is definitely very good for Maya epigraphy because many Maya or Maya people in general nowadays, of course, have a lot of knowledge, uh, cultural knowledge that has been um, basically uh, survived through the centuries. <laughs> and um, a lot of ethnographic data has already helped us solve specific questions of iconography, for example. And I think that their knowledge can also definitely help us a lot in, in epigraphy. So I think it's very important that more my people are also getting into the field. And this has happened a lot in linguistic studies, hmm. um, in Maya linguistics. Um, but now in the past couple of decades, there are also more Maya people coming into the field of epigraphy through uh, epigraphic workshops in Guatemala that started with Linda Shili, which we already, who we already talked about. And, uh, yeah, it needs to be more indigenous people in archaeology for sure there. So hopeful, a hopeful future, I hope, is coming. Let's circle back to the Maya, Maya sacrifice, because that's usually what they tend to focus on in ancient aliens or other alternative history uh, programming and writers. The thesis in this episode, at least as far as I could see it, was that the ancient Maya encountered the aliens, who sometimes were the kings, sometimes were not. These aliens then left, and when they left, the primitive, as they claim, Maya people start to sacrifice people to get them back. Again, tying into this racist idea we talked about before, but... How did sacrifice and especially bloodletting fit in with the Maya religion? So bloodletting was uh, a really important part of elite ceremonial life. And we know this was a lot more common than actual sacrifice. We know that this was done because we uh, have texts that refer to the act and also represent it. It must have been a fairly painful process. We know that for men, what they would have done was pierce through the foreskin of their penis and let blood drip from the wound. And that would have been, uh, those blood drops would fall on pieces of paper that were later burned. Whereas women would uh, pull a uh, thin rope with um, um, spines or pricks through their tongue. And uh, this would be another way of letting blood. This would have been accompanied by possible consumption of uh, other substances. We're not quite sure. But this uh, was a vital part of uh, ceremonial life. Now, sacrifices uh, more generally, they definitely happened. Uh, we're not quite sure as to, the, um, as to how often and to how uh, this was taking place. Usually in ancient Maya, we lay this information, so they seem hmm. uh, superstitious. I also think that the whole sacrifice narrative is a bit racist as yes. well. I'm, I'm sorry, to, like, we keep calling things racist, but it's just, they, it, for the Maya, it was probably mainly captives that were killed. We have a lot of scenes of captives being humiliated and hmm. being killed. And I would I would call this ritualized killings. They executed the captives, and this might have been uh, accompanied by a ritualistic setting. But I think the the whole sacrifice thing implies that pl this bloodthirsty barbaric kind of notion. I think that's definitely what they want to bring across in the episode as well. While the execution of captives was very common in the ancient world, unfortunately, it is still today in some unfortunate countries. So I think calling it sacrifice always implies something, I don't know, in a way. Mm. And it all it's fun of exoticizing other cultures. It's what we call the other. And uh, this would fit really well with uh, the audience of ancient aliens, because a lot of people might not have enough information no. before watching and watching it. So they, are, they don't have that much information to cross-check. No, and it seems, at least for me, with a rudimentary understanding of this history, as they mix up Aztec, uh, because I know that the Aztec 
did uh, have this, uh, what is called, Flower Wars, where the aim was yes. more or less to take captives for sacrifice. And I see a lot of them, that idea being repeated for the Maya. Did the Maya have the same concept of a Flower War or is this a pure Aztec idea? From the classic period, we don't have anything explicitly referring to Maya people disappeared somehow, which doesn't make sense. No. They ascended to the heavens yeah, and in they, 900 yes, CE. It. It's not the first time because they brought up Mayas several times. And in each episode, they always claim that scientists don't know where the Maya went. And, Which I mean, is great. A million Maya people. Yeah, I wonder. I, I really don't get it or where they got that information from. I mean, it's quite clear that the Maya is still there. It's quite clear that the Aztec took over as a main power of, or a big source of influence in the region later. But the Maya was still there when the Spanish arrived and is still there today. So it's a very strange claim. I think it's originated from Van Daniken, but I've not been able to track down uh, that part yet, to be honest. And yeah, sometimes they literally say that they went to the stars and all of them disappeared with the classic Maya collapse, which of course is absolute bullshit. I mean, <laughs> we have a lot of post-classic sites. Chichen Itza, for example, definitely uh, existed for longer than until 900 CE. We know this. Maya Pan, Tayasa, Lamanai, yeah. Chumanima, Ach, Ishimche, Kumarka, like a lot of uh, post-classic uh, highland sites are also Maya. Hmm. Just because the classic period expression, like the specific classic period expression of culture was changed or ceased in, in that specific way, of course, doesn't mean that Maya people... No, and the Maya the world... Maya people were similar. Yeah. Because hmm. those... And the Maya world, the Maya region was pretty large, as far as I understand it. It almost goes up into what's more than US to some extent. New Mexico, Arizona, that part... I think there's some ball courts up there even, or am I completely out? <laughs> I think they have also found balls in... Uh... Yeah, I think we will round off soon. There's one thing I want to bring up, mostly because I went down a huge rabbit hole, and I have to share it, because otherwise it was a huge waste of time. Uh... <laughs> In the later part of the episode, I start to talk about serpents and snakes and Kukulkan, something I've covered in the past. It's basically, they didn't know how to describe a spaceship, so they described those as snakes and or dragons. <laughs> and I mean, it's a silly idea. I think if you see a metal tube flying in the sky, you could put some other words to it. But they then bring up a connection to the Cherokee that there is a connection between the Cherokee calendar, that they're supposed to be based on a rattlesnake snake you can see in the sky, and that the world will end in 2012, just as the Maya did. There's a connection between the Cherokee and the Maya, which sounds rather interesting. And I knew that there was connection further up in the US, but I've never encountered the Maya and the Cherokee in that connection, uh, really. Have you encountered that? No. Um, no. Mostly because this is one of those stuff that they completely have invented. Not necessarily themselves. But I managed to track this down. So it goes back to... Uh, well, for, for, so the Cherokee calendar is not based on a snake. It's based on a turtle. So it's a lunar year. So it has 13 uh, moons. And uh, the shell of a turtle has 13 lumps uh, on the back so that's how it's connected so it's connected to a turtle not a snake the snake prophecy comes from uh, a man named charlie who uh, claimed to have visions and uh, prophecies and he was a cherokee person and he had those in 1811 the issue is that this charlie individual was a cherokee separatist all his uh, vision and prophecy was uh, connected to getting the white people out of the land so why he would suddenly claim that the world will end in 2012 does, doesn't really make sense 
And the source for this claim seems to be a certain Ellie Crystal, who published um, her reading of this prophecy in 2006 online. So, um, yeah, that claim completely fabricated by New Age people just putting their hands on stuff they find online and hope that you can't double check it. The internet has made ancient alien uh, research a lot harder, apparently, for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, I this Charlie individual seems to be representing several individuals. He not always named Charlie, but he's also always accompanied by two women. And they're always uh, talking about how the Cherokee people need to rid the land of um, the um, colonial uh, power of the Americas, which I can somewhat understand or quite. I mean, I can see why, why they would want to do that uh, <laughs> for sure. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but so that he suddenly would have this prophecy of end times doesn't really make sense uh, in any shape or way but he has a nice story and a tie to the Cherokee so I guess that's why they claimed it but on that note I will thank both of you very much for your time and all your knowledge that you shared with us and if the listeners want to find out more about your work or want to read what you're doing online where should they head over amazing again huge thank you for your time and hope to see you at some thank other you for part. inviting us thank you well, and again well, sorry yeah. for having you uh, revisit your youth there and watch ancient aliens <laughs> and if you want to hear more from dimitri and marie go to their instagram account ancient maya history and next time we meet we will talk about the apocalypse that never happened. The idea that uh, the world would end in 2012 when the Maya calendar, according to some, would end. Is there any truth to this? With me, I have Andrew Kinkella from the Pseudo Archaeological Podcast, and we will examine these claims a bit uh, closer. Until then, please spread the word by leaving a positive review on platforms like iTunes, Spotify, or even better, recommend the episode to one of your friends. Get them hooked, get them <laughs> into the show. And again, you find reading recommendations for this topic on the episode page over at diggingupancientaliens.com. And if you want to support the show, I would be very happy if you would like to. You get early episodes, you get bonus content and a little bit um, extra in some cases. Just head over to patreon.com slash digging up ancient aliens or you can go the route through the members portal that you find on the website diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. And of course, you should check out all the amazing content over at archaeologicalpodcastnetwork.com. And if you want to contact me, it can be done through most social media sites. And if you have comments, corrections, suggestions, or just hankering to write that all caps email, you find my contact info on the website. Sandra Martelor created the intro music and are outraged by the band called Tralskruv, who sings their song Folie Hat. Links to both of these artists can be found in the show notes. Until next time, keep shoveling that science.
Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. Remember that we have a subscription going on. You can become a patron or other subscriber for as little as two fifty per episode. Go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. That is, go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to read more information and sign up right there. 